The following is an encore presentation of the State of Greater West New York report. The original 1915, a silent film called Inspiration came out. And in that film, actress Audrey Munson did something that no other movie actress had done before. And Audrey's not famous for being an actress. She's famous for being famous. And she's an actress for being famous. Yet for all the Grecian perfection of her figure, her story reads like a Greek tragedy. We're going to explore that story in today's edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. It's a piece of history. It's also something that might disturb some people. So I'm going to warn you for before, you know, right now that some of the pictures that we're going to show are not the kind of pictures that you're going to want to show to kids. So be warned and be ready and be welcome to this week's edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report, which as always is brought to you by... Each week our community makes history. Each week you make history. And each week there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to the Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The men in Honey Lake Falls line us Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome everyone to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Well, today we're going to be talking about a little bit of history, a little bit of a Hollywood history that starts in Rochester, New York. Yes, we're going to be talking about the story of Audrey Munson. Audrey Munson was born in 1886, if I am correct in saying that. And she, well, let's 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 take a <clears throat> let's take a peek at her and see what she looks like in this close-up shot. Now, this shot is from 1915, and you can see I'm blowing it up behind me so that it's actually the wrong shot that I want to show. This is the shot that I want to show, a close-up of her. That's the same picture, 1915. And, and how does her story start? Her story starts really with the marriage between Edgar Munson, who's a descendant of a long line of New England Methodists, and Catherine Kitty Mahoney, the daughter of Irish Catholic immigrants. This marriage took place on January 7th, 1885, and it must have caused quite a stir. The newlyweds soon moved to Rochester, working for a wealthy family in their home on East Avenue. Six years later, on January 8, 1891, Kitty gave birth to what would be the couple's only child, Audrey Marie Munson, whose picture you see here. Alas, things would not go well between Kitty and Edgar, and following a move to Providence, Rhode Island, when Audrey was still young, the couple divorced. With the judge granting sole custody of the seven-year-old Audrey to Kitty, Edgar moved back to their original hometown outside of Syracuse, rem remarried and started a new family. Audrey learned her skills as an entertainer in Providence, and following the completion of her education, moved with her mother to New York City. Here is Audrey's own account of her discovery at the age of 15 on the streets of New York. I was standing in front of a department store window on Fifth Avenue in New York, wondering if, when I grew up to have money of my own, I could afford to buy some of the expensive hats I saw in the window. I saw a young man come up, raised his hat, and said he was a photographer, and very respectfully asked me if I would like to come to his studio and pose for him. He said he would like to make some studies of my face. I was pleased, of course. He gave me his card which read Ralph Draper, and asked me to talk it over with my mother and bring her to the, his studio. His suggestion that I bring my mother seemed to show that he was sincere. Mother was interested and flattered, too. 
she took me along and I posed for a number of photographs. Andrea Geyer, who researched Audrey Munster and found no records of Ralph Draper anywhere in New York City records, but did find early photographs of Audrey with another photographer's signature, Oscar Scholin. Now, Scholin's uh, studio was located on 51 West 10th Street, the same location as the studio of Boat sculptor Isidore Conti, Adolf Weinman, and Daniel Chester French. For those interested in such things, such as red herrings, the Beaux-Arts style was a neoclassical architectural movement that evoked Renaissance and classical styles. Whoever the photographer who was who first spotted her, he then introduced her to sculptor Conti. Conti asked her to pose for him. Of course, pose to an artist generally means sans clothing, and Conti first had some convincing to do. To us, he is reported to have said, it makes no difference if our models are clothed or draped in furs. We see only the work we are doing. Although initially circumspect, Kitty, Audrey's mother, eventually gave in and allowed her daughter to pose. Considering her first work, Condi would go to create the Three Graces in 1907, a sculptor that adorned the Hotel Astor until it was demolished in 1967. And I'm going to show you a few of the uh, of the photographs that she did, not photograph, sculptures. This is one of the first ones that she made. And this is a gravesite, a memorial. And it was done when she was 15 years old. So she was quite young, quite early in her sculpting movements. But very quickly on, that, this one's from 1906 now. Very quickly, like three years later, in the Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art, that sculptor that we referred to, J Daniel Chester French, used Audrey for a pose in the Metropolitan M Museum of Art. This is a famous pose called Memory, a famous statue. In addition, she then went on uh, to pose for another fountain or, or statue. This is a fountain in Washington, D.C., which was actually disassembled in 1941 and uh, then reassembled later. So it, it's, uh, there's a number of picture of sculptures that she is quite involved with. And, and this fellow, uh, Daniel Chester French, really, I think, was the individual who sought, sort of launched her career in terms of the, the pictures that you see. Now, I don't have it here, but one of her one of her statues adorns the top of the Wisconsin uh, Capitol building, Capitol Dome. So, and she modeled Audrey modeled for at least ten of his statues, and this one called Wisconsin, I, <laughs> interestingly enough, is is the one that uh, is probably most famous. And about that. This is what he said, as I know of no other model with a particular style that Miss Munson possesses. There is a certain ethereal atmosphere about her that is rare. She is decidedly, she has a decidedly expressive face that's always changing. Like Wisconsin, with Audrey's most famous New York City piece, Civic Fame, stands at the pinnacle of the Manhattan Municipal Building. It's three times life size, second only to the Statue of Liberty in terms of dimensions in all of the Big Apple. For this, Audrey would earn the name Miss Manhattan in the summer of 1913. At least that's according to the New York Sun. Adolf Weinman sculpted civic fame, and you might also know him as the designer both of the popular Mercury head dime and the Walking Liberty half dollars. So his sculptures or artwork appeared on coins. There's some speculation that Weinman used Munson as the model for both coins, although Elsie Stevens, wife of lawyer and poet Wallace Stevens, may have been the model. It's been said Weinman may have been inspired by Robert Ingersoll Atkins' rendition of Liberty in the 1915 Panama, Panama, Panama Pacific International Exhibition Medal. So we know Weinman was at the PPIE when he contributed several pieces with Munson as his model. We also know Munson posed for Atkins coin. Ah, this, this pan, 
Pan American or Pan Pacific uh, International Exposition, this PPPI. What was it all about? This was meant to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal, as well as the 400th anniversary of Balboa's discovery of the Pacific Ocean. And its organizers appointed A. Sterling Caldor as chief sculptor. You might recognize the name of Caldor's son, Alexander. And if you don't recognize his, your name, you certainly recognize his modernistic mobile sculptures. The elder Calder invited Audrey to come to the PPIE as the primary female model. In all, she posed for 75% of the statues and murals, including both female figures on Itkin's coin, and earned the nickname, the Exposition Girl. You know, so it's, it's here's several of the po pics, or poses, sculptures actually, that appeared at the Pan Pacific Exposition. And Audrey was certainly one of them. In fact, this is 1915 now. So it's so famous that she actually made the cover of a magazine. One of the sculptures, this is one of the sculptures from that exhibition. She made that cover there. So you have this very famous model who is becoming popular, certainly in the art world, and well known now among people who are going to these expositions and seeing you know, what they see there. What happens next? Well, what happens next is going to be the twist of the story that really it's, <laughs> you're, gonna be, you're gonna be fairly amazed to find out. It, it, it's one of those things that if you think about it, it, it really is a classic Hollywood tale, the kinds of tales that you, uh, you know, you kind of wonder about. And, uh, oh, that is a phone in the background. Sorry for that, if you're hearing that on the line. And it, we're going to talk a little bit about this tale when we come back. And then what else happened with Audrey after her Hollywood debut? We'll be back in a moment. Through the mists of time, nature and man have both created and buried treasures beyond the imagination. With the ages, these riches slowly dissolve into mere myths until they are forever forgotten. But there are those brave souls who tirelessly cling to the truth, ever seeking to discover the undiscovered, to reveal what has always been there to uncover the hidden gems of a land thought forsaken, but loved by millions. Fifty Hidden Gems of Greater Western New York. Discover the secrets in your own backyard. Buy your copy now at 50hiddengems.com. By the way, the story of Audrey Munson is one of the chapters in 50 Hidden Gems, and you'll be able to read it yourself uh, if you take a look at the book. We had a question for somebody. So we, yes, Audrey was born in Rochester, New York, but she moved to Providence when she was younger. She actually went to school there to learn about acting and singing and that sort of thing, entertainment, not to be a model. She didn't go to school to be a, a, an artist or anything like that. It was purely coincidental that she got into the sculptor uh, profession or this modeling profession for sculptors. Uh, and someone asked, did she ever come back to Western New York? And we won't, we won't spoil it for you. She got pretty close. Remember where her father ended up living. We'll continue on with the rest of the story, as they say, of Audrey Munson. And like I say, this is the part of the story where we're going to be showing you some pictures that are from these, from, well, you'll see what I say. But again, if, uh, if, you, if nudity is a problem with you, then you're going to want to turn off 
this and not uh, watch the rest of the show. Nothing, nothing of this is, is terribly graphic. Um, and, it, and in fact, if the statues were okay with you, then these pictures should be okay, as you'll find out in a moment. So where did we leave off with Audrey? She's in San Francisco. She's at the Pan Pacific International Exposition. And where's that make her close to? Well, it makes her close to Hollywood. So if you're famous and you're out in San Francisco, there's a good chance that Hollywood might come calling. Remember, she's famous. Hollywood likes famous people because that sells movie tickets. So, of course, that's naturally what Hollywood did. They came calling for Audrey. The budding movie industry, now remember, it's, it's not the mature movie industry that we know of today. This is 1915. Movies are just starting. They're silent movies. Don't forget that. So talking isn't really that big of a thing. But they want to, they want to capitalize on these famous people. Again, to draw people in. And they decided that Audrey, who actually, as I mentioned, did learn to sing and dance in Rhode Island, was just that talent. But they wondered, could she act? She did not go to school for acting. She went to school for singing and dancing. Let's well, think about it. What does Hollywood do when they have a famous person if they don't know how to act? They don't know if they can act. So if you can't act, and Hollywood creates a movie story where you don't have to act. You just play the same part you play in real life. So what you do in real life is what the movie's about. So Audrey's first movie, which was called Inspiration, featured her in the role of a sculptor's model. Pretty easy, right? She doesn't really have to do any acting. She just has to pose. Well, not so fast now. Here's, here's where the twist comes in. It turns out sculptor's models have a rather unique occupational requirement. They need to disrobe. In this retro Puritan area, era of the Constop Commission, that's what's going on right now. Public nudity was a no-no. Under threats of censorship, the film's producers were able to convince the powers that be not to censor their movie. After all, given this was not a porn film, but an homage to art, to censor inspiration would be to censor all Renaissance and classical art. So, remember what I said about the Beaux Arts studio uh, a few moments ago how that's really, they were retro into this Renaissance and classical art. Well, now you're seeing how it's, it's all connecting. So as a result, Audrey, and here we go for those curious, became the first legitimate film actress to act without the need of a wardrobe department. Here's a still from that movie and another one. So you can see what's going on here. She's just posing, uh, but she's not posing with any clothes on. So, you know, she, she went in to actually, by the way, <laughs> the movie opened to mixed reviews, but it apparently generated enough revenue to justify more movies. She made several more. Uh, one of them was called Purity, uh, ironically enough. Uh, and it came out the following year, and here's a here's a publicity still from that movie, and a and a, a frame still from that movie. Again, she looks very statuesque in the movie Purity. And you can see Purity's even using one of the statues from the Pan, Pan, Pan Pacific International Exposition as a way of promoting the movie itself. So this was in 1916. Uh, there's only a single copy of Purity uh, that exists, but a second one does exist, I think, in France. Uh, although we, so we don't, we don't have the other movies, but we do have these stills, and we do have like the playbills, what I showed you before. This particular thing is actually an advertisement that appeared in the newspaper to promote the movie. Purity. 
Now, remember, Purity's original name was Innocence. They changed it. So what happened was she acted for a few more movies. There's another movie called Heedless, which uh, she... Oops, let's get rid of that one. Which she, uh, again, posed in. But then what she did in 1921 is she went on a theater run and did these movies. And here you have the name Innocence coming up. Did these movies in theater. And she started writing articles, and those articles were picked up nationally with other papers. And if you read her work, there's a serialized autobiography uh, called Queen of the Artists Studios. That was published in 1921, the same year that she's doing this. So remember, she's only about 30 years old at this point, And she's pretty wise and insightful uh, for someone that age. You know, she's kind of been around. And it's, you know, it's kind of interesting what really happens later on. So let's go back a couple years before, 1919. That's when things really started to get worse. That year, Audrey and her mother were forced to move out of their apartment because their landlord's wife was jealous. Uh, later, while the two were in Canada on business, the landlord, whose name was Dr. Walter Wilkins, killed his wife claiming he wanted to be with Audrey. Out of the country and hard to find suspicions grew until the police found Audrey and her mother in Toronto, so they clearly didn't have anything to do with it. Audrey was eventually cleared, but the damage was done. Uh, Audrey herself felt the straw that broke the camel's back occurred when she spurned an unwanted advance from a prominent man in the theater world. Running out of funds, the mother and daughter had no choice but to move back to Mexico. New York. There you go. Mexico, New York was right outside of Syracuse. And uh, she lived in a series of properties that her father owned and was slow, solely selling. So this, so this was going on in uh, Mexico. By the way, in 1921, she actually uh, was arrested in St. Louis for this stage production of Innocence. Again, she was posing nude like she did in the movies. And, and all it was, all the stage production was, was a series of poses. She would pose for the statues, show people how she posed for the statues that people made of her, that the artists made of her. So, it, it, you know, things weren't really going too well. At one point, her mother tried to fix her up with the son of a prominent uh, businessman. Uh, here's his picture over here. Uh, this was not the son, this was the father. But uh, here's a picture of their house, so you can get a, a sense for how prominent they might have been. But the, but the story itself kind of begins to go haywire. So they're living in Syracuse. Their, their life in Mexico is worlds apart from New York City. And there's really no place for Audrey to disappear into the crowd. And everybody knew and didn't necessarily approve of her career exploits. It, she actually attempted to sue movies that she was in, the movie companies, to obtain royalties. But those suits failed. In an attempt to form her own production company, the Audrey Munson Producing Corporation, in, wait for it, Rochester. So she sort of did come back. That would fail, unfortunately. Finally, after a nationwide search for the perfect man failed, Audrey tried to end it all by so swallowing a solution of bi bichloride of mercury. That's right, she tried to kill herself. And wouldn't, wouldn't it have been ironic if the model of the winged head of liberty on the mercury died, would have, a dime would have died consuming Mercury. Well, things really would become worse, quite worse, uh, as hinted at Audrey's odd insistence on referring to herself as Baroness Audrey Mary Munson Mons Monson. That's right, Munson dash Monson. So she was calling herself that just before she attempted suicide. Uh, within a decade, 
and, and on the exact date of her 40th birthday, no less, she would be institutionalized at the St. Lawrence State Hospital for the Insane in Ogdensburg, New York. There she would stay for the rest of her life. It would be decades before she would have a visitor. And her niece, by then Audrey was well into her 80s, uh, found out about her. Uh, she appeared happy and lucid, lucid, I should say, and expressed no desire to leave. And she would just, she would die just shy of her 105th birthday in 1996. She's buried by her father in what was an unmarked grave, but has since been marked. Uh, and it's a, uh, the, the final irony is that her, her gravestone is, uh, is pretty simple, which is, which is very different for someone who really comes from a Beaux Arts sort of legacy. And, you know, there, there are stories that Audrey would wander off from this state hospital. And towards the end, she was the only inmate in the hospital and she would wander off go across the street and eventually come back i mean she really didn't want to leave she was quite happy with with where she was and and how she was and it's it's really amazing that her story has not yet been made into a movie because this really speaks to hollywood a hundred percent and now of course the kind of casual nudity that you see in movies all the time has become accepted and in fact it's 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 her audrey's posing is a much milder form uh, than what we see in today's movies so it, it's it's just odd and ironic that we haven't seen hollywood do a movie on this particular person there have been books autobiographies full books written about her about her life and they're, they make for interesting reading. They're, think about the era that was going on. Here we have a supermodel who was a member of the jet set before there were jets. In fact, her career started, there were barely planes. You know, she started in the early 1900s. Orville and Wilder had just taken off in Kitty Hawk and, you know, found the magic of flight. And yet here she was, she was, she was going from coast to coast uh, you know, being a superstar, really a supermodel, and all pretty much in her teens and 20s. By the time she hit 30, she was done. She was over. And I think that might have affected her disposition on life and led to what where she ended up. There are, of course, different things in her life, romantic things that may have complicated issues too. But, you know, it, it's... And I, I tell you that, but that makes a more interesting Hollywood movie. So, who knows? Maybe one of these days we'll we'll see the life of Audrey Munson, the Manhattan. What did she call herself? The Manhattan model. Uh, anyways, if you want to, uh, if you want to watch shows like this, you're welcome to watch them live every Thursday. In order to do, do that, you'll need to sign up on our list so you get the secret link that allows you to become a member of the live audience, and this way you'll be able to answer questions. If you prefer, you may watch the archive versions. They're put up shortly after the show is completed, or you can watch the rebroadcast, which occurs every Sunday at 1.30 on our Facebook page. If you like our Facebook page, you will be notified when the show starts running. If you prefer YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll be, see, be able to see when the show airs live there. You'll be notified for that too. So either way, you can go ahead and sign up and experience this show. But until then, we will see you next week when we bring on a special guest again. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm.